Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Campus Consortium's Ed Talks, featuring Mr. Philip D. Long, PhD, Senior Scholar at the Georgetown University Center for New Designs in Learning and Scholarship. Today's topic for Ed Talks is the next step after blockchain basics. Our presenters include Mr. Philip Long, Senior Scholar at the Georgetown University Center for New Designs in Learning and Scholarship and Mr. Vincent Lamba, Vice President, Community Engagement at Campus Consortium. We will take questions at the end of today's presentation that have been typed into the chat box or questions pane in your GoToWebinar control panel. Without further ado, please allow me to present Mr. Lamba and Mr. Long. Over to you, Vincent. Thank you, Roger, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. It is an honor for us to have Philip present for us today. For those who have joined us for the webinar, I would like to take a minute to introduce uh, Philip. <clears throat> Philip is a senior scholar at the Georgetown University Center for New Designs in Learning and Scholarship. Phil worked previously as a Chief Innovation Officer for Project 2021 and the, Associ and the Associate Vice Provost at the University of Texas, Austin. His current work focuses on distribution ledgers in the context of documenting competencies and higher ed credentialing, learning analytics, emerging technologies, learning engineering, and the design of physical learning spaces. Phil is an honorary professor at the Institute for Teaching and Learning Innovation at the University of Queensland, Brisbane, Australia. Donning many hats, Phil also serves on the board of Nexford University, a competency-based startup serving students in developing countries. He's the founder of RHC Consulting, LLC, where he pursues his passion projects associated with technologies that foster learner agency. A labs bio biologist, now learning scient scientist, Phil focuses on emerging technologies the cognitive interactions with them, and the spaces, physical and virtual, wherein they occur. Philip, it's an honor to have you address our audience today. I would like to pass the platform over to you from here on. Give me a second as I pass the control over to you. And I'm going to go ahead and unmute you as well. Over to you, Philip. Very good. Thank you very much. And welcome everyone to um, this um, brief presentation on the next steps after the blockchain. So I'm going to assume that you sort of have a blockchain basics understanding um, and that when I refer to that, um, you are at least generically aware of, um, of what a blockchain is. What I'd like to do instead is to um, present to you information that is uh, an arc uh, for this talk that begins with questioning whether blockchains are in fact hyper substance, and then pointing out an important distinction in its architecture between public and permissioned uh, types of blockchains. One of the things that was originally the intent of the blockchain uh, architecture when it was first introduced and is a central issue today is its the very fact that it is addressing the issues and problems of centralization. So what does that mean and what is the what is the value and importance to that to us? Then I want to give you a use case that's being developed as we speak as I'm working with Arizona State University in an application of blockchains for credentialing. And then I will highlight what I think is an interesting characteristic of blockchains um, in that it can actually create markets where there were none before. And the example I'm going to use is um, in the area of genomics. Finally, I want to recognize what is one of the realizations that when you work with this uh, that you will come to, I believe, which is that we have to rethink data ownership. And in particular, consider data about ourselves as property and, have, and the ramifications that that brings with it. And then after that, we'll have some time for questions. So without further ado, let's get started. The defining technology 
uh, in the last decade or more, 15 years, has been really cloud computing. Cloud computing in 2008 was kind of an upstart, and many wondered if it was, in fact, more than just vaporware uh, and a promise, really. Today, we're iterating over efficiencies in cloud systems, modularization with the development of microservices, and a whole range of what are effectively incremental enhancements. But the actual major shifts that have happened with the introduction of the cloud are have been done, and we're now at that phase of incremental improvement. And in effect, what I'm going to suggest is that we have reached peak tech, if you will, among the blockchain and, excuse me, among the big tech giants, and that we are now ripe for another major shift. Now, it's important to think about um, the blockchain in the context of uh, Amara's law, <coughs> which I think is very applicable here. And that law says that the impact of technology is often overestimated in the short term and underestimated in the long run. Indeed, we're at that moment where uh, if you have a technology pain point, then the people immediately generally at this stage turn to the next new thing, in this case, read blockchain as a potential solution. Well, it's never worked well that way before and it doesn't work well that way now. This is, a character, uh, this is characteristic of new paradigms. And while the underlying technology is not new, that is the distributed databases under which the blockchain is based have been around for more than a couple of decades. But it's the marriage of this to the peer-to-peer -peer technology environment and a very creative application of mathematics that makes this extremely different. There is huge interest in the blockchain initially driven from the finance folks and the crypto cryptocurrency world, but uh, it's staggering in size and the monetary investment that has occurred there, but that isn't really what's important to us. Nevertheless, it is a huge uh, amount of money that's been poured into this. And I just want to illustrate that with a graphic that follows, and it has no audio track underneath it, so I'll just sort of talk through it. It is, in fact, a listing of the investments in blockchain-related technologies in the last just four years. And you'll see in the upper left the increasing amount of funds raised around these various projects and the size of the bubble represents the approximate amount associated with that and in the last year and a half it has exploded and that's just in the uh, primarily fintech world that is financial and technology and cryptocurrency space so it, this is a huge huge amount of money and now while that sits at six billion it's now much uh, in the much larger than that. Last estimate I heard about block, uh, Bitcoin alone was in the area of close to 50 billion. So this is, if this is a flash in the pan, that's a heck of a pan. Now, the attack of the 50-foot blockchain, which is a book that came out about uh, six months ago, reflects the impact of the hype associated with this. But it is important to distinguish between Bitcoin and the blockchain. Bitcoin was the first widely adopted digital cash or cryptocurrency, and it was officially created so that people could exchange the transactions that were monetary without the need of a middleman. Underneath it sits this distributed, le distributed ledger. And the key point I wanna make here is that they are not the same thing. They are very, very distinct. And what has happened in the last year and a half is the recognition that the underlying distributed ledger has wide applicability to many other contexts. Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency coin applications are just that. They're applications of this suite of distributed ledger technologies. On the right, you see one iteration of a view of that suite with distributed applications sitting on the top. Um, you have uh, various messaging and storage environments associated with the platforms that are, that are dealing with that. In the case of Hyperledger, you have a separate state machine that's involved, consensus mechanisms, and then you have off-chain and related activities associated with governance and, uh, and various other um, um, functions. And then underneath that is the actual crypt uh, the cryptographic um, uh, methods of, of protecting data and transport protocols. So this is an entire stack of technologies that are underlying this, that you should not confuse with a particular application. 
Oops, what just happened here? There we go. So you have a distributed ledger set of suite of technologies. And the key point to remember is that it can be programmed to record and track anything of value. It happened that money was the first thing of interest. But anything that is digital and that has value is equally a candidate for consideration. And there are all kinds of consensus algorithms. You all know about proof of work, which is the solving of cryptographic puzzles, uh, which has gotten to be the bane of the Bitcoin world in the sense of the amount of energy that's expended to do that. Um, you have uh, proof of stake, which involves a method by which your actual contribution to the environment is a purport, gives you proportional representation in making uh, claims for being able to commit records in it. You have delegated proof of stake, which allows a little bit more uh, centralized control. You have proof of authority. You have the latest versions of um, the environment that are associated with directed acrylic graphs or acyclic graphs. You have things in the Byzantine um, fault uh, tolerance uh, area that are trying to address possible ways that the environment can be attacked. And you have, as a consequence of all of this, um, consensus algorithms that are all concentrated around accomplishing three, uh, two facts. The first is that their role is to order transactions uniquely. And the second is to verify compliance with both policy rules and or formats of the data. Clearly the verifying format is typical of any individual or any process which is committing records to a, a permanent uh, repository, database or otherwise. C verifying compliance policies allows the commit of a record to be checked in terms of whether or not the rules of the organization that um, are, is using this environment are being followed. <laughs> and then for it to be uh, a unique uh, um, and accurate record, of course, the orders have to be um, transacted in a way that is uh, sequenced and um, distinct. It is a distributed ledger. Uh, the distributed ledger is separate from the original and the common method of having a central clearinghouse and a centralized repository that multiple people draw on. And that's what gives rise to this notion of multiple nodes. And if you're familiar at all with, uh, with the Bitcoin backends, all the different nodes in the networks have the opportunity to run a copy of the ledger, et cetera, et cetera, which leads to both a democratization of the process, but also leads to performance issues. The key thing that is emerging here is that all of the original blockchains, that is Bitcoin and original Ethereum uh, main and others, have been public blockchains. That is to say, anyone can participate. Per they are permissionless and anonymous. The security to be their whole design, the, the, the brilliance of the design of the network was to allow individuals to participate fully who may in fact be attempting uh, nefarious acts to disrupt things and to design a system which made it more rewarding to conform to the rules than it was to try to hack the rules. But the consequence of that is that the blockchain transaction rate is relatively slow. Bitcoins, for example, is seven transactions a second at its peak. Private blockchains <coughs> can exist. They are no different than, in that case, um, a single organization with multiple copies of uh, a repository. They are permissioned in the sense that they have access that's associated with uh, the credentials of the organization, and therefore everybody is known in the environment. Um, security is pre-approved. Typically, the methods for committing records involve some method of voting or multi-party consensus, and they are much faster. But that notion of being in a single organization eliminates many of the potential values that the blockchain affords, and it is the federated or consortium kind of model that people seem to be focusing on quite appropriately, where you have multiple organizations together that already have some form of trust relationship among them. Therefore, the environment uh, is based on a permissioned basis. Not everybody can play, only those that are part of the organization. Therefore, the ent entities in there are known. And like the, the uh, private environment, uh, pre-approved participants and voting along the lines that can be as simple as, um, we associate Sally Smith to be the committer of these records and everybody agrees. And that's that. Or you can have more elaborate consensus mechanisms. And they are, in fact, considerably faster 
in their performance. So what does the centralization of data risk? Why are we bothering with this whole method of blockchains that distribute records across multiple nodes? And what are we trying to mitigate? Well, the web has centralized around a handful of corporate providers over the last decade or so. And these platforms have enormous influence. Decentralization is less corruptible and more resistant to corporate or political regulation and censorship. But economies of scale can be achieved with centralization that provide efficiencies and cost reductions. And so the question is how to reach a balance in these matters. You'll see on the right hand side of the slide that there is a list of those uh, organizations which have the largest market share or capital share, beginning with Amazon and then continuing with Alphabet, Google's parent, uh, JDCom in China, Facebook, and then a string of other Chinese companies, Tencent, Alibaba, uh, Alibaba and uh, Booking Holdings, and, and on down to the last being eBay in this list of 10, which correspond to roughly a half a trillion dollars valuation. So that's what our current environment is looking like, and those players are getting bigger and stronger. Sorry. Now, God darn it, I'm... Let's remember the problem. We place our trust in organizations that are maintaining our data in a central place. And there are rules and various other things around that organization and such, which we have invested in and which limit our ability to manage and manipulate that data. Centralized systems as we all know, are single points of failure. And so we try to do various things to, to protect against that with huge amounts of effort spent on, on backups and redundancies in various forms. But nevertheless, they are in fact single points of failure. How big is that a problem is that? Well, let's illustrate that problem briefly by demonstrating the last, oh, I guess it's about four years worth of hacks on centralized systems. So what you'll see here, if this plays out nicely, and we'll see if we can get it to run, there we go, is a list of hacks that have happened since 2004, and the approximate size of the circles represent the amount of data, in this case, mostly user records that have been stolen in the process of these hacks. And as we approach 2010s, things can start to get more intense, and all of a sudden, you start to see the magnitude of the exposure that having these honeypots of information afford and the risk that we incur as a consequence of that. So now you have almost the entire screen colored. Well, then comes Adhar, India's biometric identity system. There, they had 1.4 billion identities stolen. And that happened uh, in January of this year. And of those 1.4 billion, um, the, the uh, organization was actually a newspaper um, reporter that was able to buy the 1.4 billion worth of records for a total of $8. And for another uh, $10 was able to get uh, fabricated identity biometric cards for any of the particular records from that set. That's pretty astonishing. So we have now something on the order of 2.5 billion uh, billion user records that have been stolen. And I just learned this morning there's another hack um, that happened in the last few days. This is not going away. And despite our efforts to, to put forth protected centralized uh, security uh, systems in place, we are unlikely to be able to resist that effectively going forward. So two quick asides. The first is, you may have heard of GDPR, you may be dealing with that on your own individual campuses, and in the context of blockchains, the question is, what does GDPR have uh, to do with blockchains, and in fact, does the right of erasure, so-called, uh, in the GDPR, um, tend to mean that blockchains is not a viable technology going forward? And the reason that it might not be uh, in this context, as you well know, is that has the characteristics of its records being immutable. Once a record is written, it cannot be erased. It can be updated, it can be supervened, but it cannot be erased. 
Well, a number of things have occurred that allow um, the possibility for blockchains and GDPR to coexist. Um, one is that perhaps it's not really the deletion that's critical, it's inaccessibility uh, of the information. That is, if you can make it so it can't be found, even if it's not gone, that might be sufficient. So it's true that you can encrypt or you know, anonymize and encrypt data on blockchains, that may be sufficient. Well, the second issue is that not everything needs to be kept on the blockchain and you can have side chains and off chains storage with PID data that is not open and accessible to the public. And thirdly, you can begin to think about this in a hybrid environment and use trusted computing enclaves such as Intel's SGX, which, <laughs> which is the direction I believe Microsoft's Azure is heading at the moment. So it's not clear um, yet which of these combinations of things might satisfy the GDPR, but there is reason to believe that the courts will ultimately get together and some combination of these will end up being a reasonable proxy for the idea of, of erasure. Secondly, there is the question that I just alluded to a minute ago of off-chain storage versus on-chain storage. That's relevant in a number of ways. Um, for example, it is the case that um, blockchains do not do well with high density, large volume um, blobs. So the question is what should go on chain and what in fact should stay off chain? And if so, what is a good off chain option? Most of us looking at this are looking at off chain options that follow the general architectural design of the blockchain itself, which means some kind of distributed peer to peer environment and the one that seems most attractive at the moment is IPFS or with structured data IPFS LD for um, linked data. While those are still uh, nascent technologies in many ways, they are being explored currently and looked promising as a method by which data can be linked via a pointer on a block from a block, but that link can be both hashed and encrypted so that the off-chain stored location can retain the characteristic of immutability in that once something has written, you know that it has not been modified or changed if the link to that idea, to that um, object is both hashed and, uh, and encrypted itself. So where does this play in terms of possible higher education applications? Arizona State is in the process of doing a, a year-long blockchain pilot. We spent the first six months of that pilot developing 11 use cases for consideration. And that ended in the end of, end of June. As of the beginning of July, we picked two of ones which we think are the most um, interesting in terms of testing the idea behind the architecture itself, as well as testing the value proposition for uh, communities. So part one was looking at a proof of concept for the blockchain. And the general attributes that any blockchain affords and the ones that we're particularly interested in in the case of, of ASU <laughs> were things that involved giving agency to learners, the ability for the learner to create their credentials themselves, even if from multiple issuers. The idea that um, the learner should become and be considered a trusted party in this relationship of credentials. It's kind of an irony at the moment that we all have accepted that the learner in the relationship of, let's say, a prospective employer, the institution where the learner is getting their credentials issued from, and the learner themselves, that that tripartite set leaves the learner as the untrusted party in the relationship, even though they've done all the work and the credential is actually relating to their accomplishments. But as a learner, I can't send credentials directly to an employer. Those are considered untrustworthy and therefore uh, I have to make an issuing request to the institution to do so on my, beha my behalf. The persistence of the assertion of learning needs to be absolutely guaranteed. You may recall recently where DeVry went uh, belly up and the learners that were associated with DeVry were sort of caught in a trap because all of their credentials were with them now an organization that has no longer any existence. And the Department of Education and others negotiated with third parties to take on those credentials and continue, allow those individuals 
uh, to have those credentials persist. And finally, the idea of leveraging existing trust relationships in a blockchain environment um, as a way of beginning to explore this without necessarily simply making a public uh, chain and having any institution or group of institutions join it. So we ended up with multiple um, uh, use cases. This is a sample of them. One is from the Young Thinkers program, which prepared block, uh, populations to start college. It's essentially a bridge program for individuals who completed high school in a, in a location, but where the completion of their high school credential didn't prepare them well enough uh, to be likely to be successful in college. And so this is a bridge program that helps. In this case, it happens to be with a foreign population from a different part of the world. There is um, a number of others here listed. You see education for humanity, micro-credentialing of learning achievements, that is applying the badging idea to blockchains. And the one that I want to pay particular attention to is this reverse credit one. And that's of interest largely to four-year institutions, probably more to public four-year institutions than, than private. But it's the context for a community college student um, works and does coursework at their local community college for a period of time, usually for a period of time less than necessary to complete their AA, at least in many cases that's true. But they use that time to demonstrate they can do the work and save some money. And then they transfer to a four-year institution with whatever credits transfer with them. And they continue towards their BS or BA at the four-year institution. Well, it turns out in doing so, many students actually complete the requirements of their AA degree through the courses they're taking at the four-year institutions. Some institutions have systems in place to try to address that for those community college immediately proximate to them or which are the biggest feeders to them. But it's a relatively arduous manual process involving multiple reports and cross-checking. What we're looking at in this case is to establish the aggregation of courses at the community uh, at the community college before they transfer and put them into a course map that is in entered into the blockchain. And then the additional courses while the student has moved to the four year are added to the blockchain and a smart contract looking at the timing and the con possible uh, convergence of the four year course requirements and the remaining two year course degree requirements and then flagging the institutions when that congruence looks like it has been achieved. Trying to automate this process so that students can graduate, whether they finish the four-year program or not, they may well finish their program associated with their two-year degree and at least have the issuing institution at the community college level give them the opportunity to be recognized for that. Um, as opposed to the worst case scenario where life happens while they're in their four-year program and instead of completing the four year, they end up dropping out and then they have neither the two year degree nor the four year degree. And the only guarantee they have is debt. So the second phase of the ASU project in this proof of concept was a bake off between Hyperledger and Ethereum. In this case, a particular Ethereum permission flavor from uh, JP Morgan called Quorum. The idea was we wanted to make uh, an assessment of the developer community and support community and third party corporate community um, around these architectures because it's it's a risky space. We want to make sure that when we're investing in a, even in a proof of concept, we have an environment where there are people around who are accessible and talented and responsive to be able to give us a hand. And so that's where we are right now. Hyperledger has been installed. Uh, this week, the sprint is involving uh, the implementation of the Quorum Ethereum flavor. And we are working through um, the community engagements around these, these different architectures to see whether or not, in our judgment, they're responsive and accurate and helpful. Um, and we will choose one to go forward with the proof of concepts. Now enter uh, an important characteristic that's relevant, at least to Arizona State and many other institutions, I suspect. ASU is the largest client of Salesforce in the higher ed space. So they have a very extensive investment in Salesforce and its related technologies. In the case of the reverse credential environment, the intention here is to leverage Salesforce as essentially a middleware, that is, to allow the environment of Salesforce, particularly the CRM, 
as a place to aggregate data before it gets committed to the blockchain. So at, sale, at uh, ASU, uh, SIS is PeopleSoft. Um, the notion here is that we will be pulling data from PeopleSoft and moving it to the, to the CRM along with other related uh, achievement data, whether that is uh, badging information or other sorts of extracurricular information, and essentially creating the personal persistent record of the learner in the CRM environment. And we will then use um, a in middleware connecting technology that Salesforce recently acquired in the form of MuleSoft as a, plat as a platform by which publishing to the blockchain can take place. So in effect, what we have here is uh, the opportunity to have a student with a mobile app that connects to the blockchain um, through uh, the environments associated with um, with the Salesforce middleware, the MuleSoft environment, and the blockchain getting populated from the systems enterprise records of the institution to create an integrated look at the student from a student-centric perspective, and then the you know the comparison we mentioned earlier of Hyperledger as a possible blockchain environment, or alternately, um, and publishing back and forth from the Salesforce to it. Uh, and that includes the apps and other data that might be able to be derived from that aggregation, and or Ethereum, and in the case of the flavor of Ethereum um, quorum as the, the blockchain environment. We have not made that decision quite yet. But that's the general sort of high level notion of this architecture. Where else then might blockchains be relevant? Well, it's pretty obvious that those places which have high overheads for things like safety and, um, and protection. So for example, um, pharmaceutical companies or in your own institutions, uh, laboratories which have um, various constraints on uh, biosafety and the like, which have to be carefully uh, documented the blockchain being a place of immutable permanent storage can eliminate a lot of the cross-checking and such that that traditional methods uh, typically require an obvious second alternative is e-payment systems because that's the orig origin of the blockchain in the first place an interesting one in the higher education space is the blockchain as an opportunity for um, doing peer review and the reason that is relevant is that the actual process of peer review really isn't surfaced in a way that the participants in it, that is faculty who are doing the peer review, get much credit for. In part, because there isn't a way to be absolutely sure and credible that the work that's being purported as being peer reviewed work has been done. And so it tends to get devalued. There is an assertion by the faculty member that I peer reviewed these 10 articles in the last quarter. Um, they might get a letter from the editor of the journal saying that's true and they'll stick all of that in their folder and the like. In the blockchain case, that's, that work can be instantiated in the blockchain itself and its, uh, its veracity is essentially uh, undeniable in that context. It's, as long as there is good quality assurance that when the record is actually created, it's true, thereafter there is no question about it. A place that you might not have thought about is in IoT devices. The provenance and uh, guarantee that a particular IoT device is sending a message to another uh, location is becoming increasingly important, especially when we're looking at things like autonomous vehicles and the cars have systems within them capturing data about their immediate surroundings. And many of these uh, autonomous vehicle development projects are leveraging that or attempting to, to send that data to other cars in the nearby vicinity so that they are updated and aware of traffic conditions and the like uh, from the vehicles that are effectively sensors for them and their immediate surroundings. So the question then becomes, how do you absolutely guarantee that the message coming from one car is coming from that car or not? And in this case, the blockchain for establishing the providence and the identity of the car is the way that many of these designs are starting to turn. And finally, this notion of, um, of personal genomics. And that's the one I want to spend a little time on because I think it's a unique case that illustrates the market making capability of blockchain environments. And the example I'm going to give you comes from um, a company called Nebula Genomics. 
In effect, the current traditional business model of genomic companies like 23andMe and Helix, Ancestry and others is a statistical um, sequencing of your genome. It's not necessarily a full genomic sequence, which is what most research companies and pharmas want in terms of having a subjects with full genomic uh, sequencing done. But it's done in this fashion where individuals send money to 23andMe and like a saliva swab, for example, they're statistically sampled then and then some analysis of their genetic profile based on that statistical sample is provided back. What's going on in the background, however, is a huge gray market of reselling that data to anybody that wants to buy it. So money is being spent by individuals to have these companies sequence it. Money is being spent by pharmas and others that want access to some of that data. And the analysis results goes back to the individual. The genomic results go back to the pharmas. And this, this gray market effectively leaves the individual out in the cold in the sense that all of their personal data is being sold for, it turns out, billions of dollars, and they don't see a bit of it. So enter Nebula Genomics. And their model, which is, I think, what's interesting about this, is to say to the pharmas and those that want the data, you should pay for it. You want fully sequenced data? cost of that is about a thousand dollars at the moment and dropping, but you should be willing to pay for it because the value proposition of having fully sequenced data from your subjects is huge for your research. So their proposal is they will take um, a sample of the user's saliva or whatever the biological source is of the genome. They will sequence it entirely with money that the pharma provides, but the data will be instantiated in a blockchain and the access to that is given back to the individual. So their data is in a blockchain that they control. Then the pharmas um, probably want phenotypic data, not just the genotypic data. That is, they want your health records and any sort of contextual data associated with your life and events that can be digitized as context for uh, understanding the genotypic data that they've collected. And they've agreed in the context of the a pilot that Nebula Genomics is running, they, the pharmas, have agreed to pay for that to be sequenced and digitized as well and put into a blockchain where that is given back to the individual. So now the individual has two sources of data that they control and own. What happens next is that the pharmas then pitch to individuals with this data research projects that they would like them to be uh, able, them to be willing to contribute their genomic and phenotypic data to and they will pay them for that. And so the individual can choose which research their data is to be uh, contributing towards. Maybe you have a family member, for example, that um, has had MS and you wanna support the development and research of potential blockbuster drugs to, to cure or mitigate uh, the conditions of MS. Then you can choose the research that is most interesting and valuable to you personally and you can use this as a mechanism to contribute to it and get paid for your data in the process. The overall blockchain environment that we're talking about here gets a little bit complicated, so I'm not gonna go too much into this, but you see the Nebula, the Nebula Genetics sequencing facility up in the upper right, where there is a Nebula blockchain environment where they're sequencing it and committing it to a, to a blockchain there. You see, uh, private storage associated with genotypic and phenotypic data of individuals, that that data is, is now in the control of the person. Um, you see that there is an opportunity for these people to, to uh, bring in other data and add it to the individual's genomic uh, and phenotypic record. All of this now is under the control of the person. And then the pharmas can make requests on that for the results of this data and do secure computing to preserve the individual's identity in the process. So we've created a couple of markets and we've created a connection between one's personal data and monetization of it that is beneficial to both parties, the farmers who need it and the individual who ought to get some reimbursement, some remuneration for stuff that is theirs. The key characteristic here, and this is what I want to point out, is that the data owners are the individuals because it is their descriptions of themselves in the form of genome sequences or phenotypic sequence data, and they are getting paid for the access and use of their data that might be beneficial to the pharmas.
or the research company of any sort. And that notion of individuals being paid for data that they have um, that is unique to them is a key re recognition and realization that many of us have come to as a missing element in our consideration of how we can think about data. Now, just as a, uh, a brief aside, the support services around blockchain research and blockchain uh, systems is rapidly growing. So you have Salesforce and now has a, an application where you can spin up a blockchain from Heroku with just a few commands. AWS recently announced that they have blockchain templates that you can work with uh, from them and spin up an AWS environment that uses either Ethereum or Hyperledger. Um, you have uh, companies like Pencil Data, which will provide you with effectively a um, consensus mechanism that you can use for any sort of blockchain and have an independent record of that. Essentially, they're building an API between blockchains and their um, consensus algorithm, which they are, uh, which you, you can have perfect transparent access to, but they're doing that for you. And, and others, and the third parties associated with Salesforce like dapps.api provide integration services and various other things that are out of the box solutions um, for particular needs. So this is a rapidly expanding space in terms of the support systems around it and the technology and the talent to help. But one of the things that I think I wanted to make as a, ma a major uh, point for you to consider in all of this is it's time for us as institutions to empower our learners and the blockchain gives us a potential for doing that. We've talked about this for a long time, but we haven't ever really done it. And you think about at the moment, the arguments around learning analytics, for example, and should the data associated with the individual's engagement with their learning uh, systems be something that the individual has transparent access to and visibility into and the like. And most institutions take a relatively conservative view saying, well, it's our job to protect that data and we don't want, nor do we think it's necessary uh, to in any way make it really available to the learner after all. What are they going to do with it? It's a particularly paternalistic view, to be honest, um, and one that I suspect is going to have to change. But the biggest change is that thinking of this data as a human right. That is to say, um, you have uh, various rights. You have a right to uh, be educated. You have a right to live in, an, in a space without fear of personal harm. Um, and in fact, the United Nations has 30 human rights that have been developed over its existence. And, um, and they are, you might argue, uh, relatively uh, um, um, applied and or um, meaningful in different parts of the world. But, but it is a statement about what it is that we as humans should have that define us. And this notion that emerges in this context that blockchains force us to consider is this notion of data as property, as opposed to data as private. And a startup and nonprofit uh, called humanity.co, lower left corner, you see their URL, um, is dedicated to promoting this idea. And they're considering it the 31st human right. And so I'd like to share for you briefly a video that uh, Richie Etwara, who is one of the founders of humanity.co, um, has put together. And it basically is imagining that 100 years from now, a young person is looking back on today and the current state of our environment, particularly vis-a-vis -vis personal and private data, and sort of giving it a, a, a perspective of what a person perhaps 100 years from now might be thinking. <laughs> so thrilled to be here today. I, I can't even believe that we are already at 60 human rights. In just a hundred years, we have defined, implemented, and agreed on an additional 30 human rights, when in the past, it took us over 5,000 years just to get the first 30 down. This teacher is a representation of where it all started, human right number 31. The right to own your own data as property and be remunerated fairly when it was used by others. My great-grandfather, Richie Itwaru, was a total badass. Like, he was one of those guys who operated his own car and everything. He presented his vision that we need more than just 30 human rights at a TED Talk. 
back then they had these things called TED and TEDx, which were weird to us now, but I guess back then they served a purpose. So basically, people would stand in these dark rooms on peculiar red dots and talk in this overly passionate and corny way, just to be recorded by a few 2D cameras, and they had a live audience, don't ask. Nonetheless, this is how our great-grandparents and their generation spread the word about new revelations back then. This t-shirt reminds me of my great-grandfather, and the initial case that data from that human should be owned by them as their own personal property, and that when it's used by others, they should be remunerated fairly for that. I mean, I can't even believe that before the United Nations adopted Article 31, our great-grandparents were being mined and farmed for data and insight without their awareness. So, so these companies could go and make hundreds of billions of you. Like, it wasn't bad enough that they were already allowed to do all these dangerous things like operate their own cars or stand in dark rooms on little red dots and talk in these overly passionate and corny ways just to get people to listen to them. Our great-grandparents and their whole generation were being mined for data and insight without their consent or awareness about any of that. And they were never getting paid for <laughs> So that's a view that um, may well be a perspective from 100 years from now. By the way, that young lady is actually uh, uh, Richie's daughter, um, and her name is Nima. Um, the point of all of this is that we need to start thinking about what would happen, what we would need to do to champion this notion that there is the choice of the individual to dispense their data as they wish and not have it simply happening in the, in the dark or gray web behind the scenes that are making uh, huge profits for companies on data that's yours. It's your property. It should be your discretion to be remunerated for it. And, uh, and so I think one of the things that's certainly come to my attention in dealing with this space is the fact that I had just no real conception of the implications of this. And the implications are absolutely enormous. So thank you for your time. I hope we have some time now for comments, and I look forward to questions that you might have. Thank you, Philip. Okay, um, we are now going to take questions uh, from the audience, and uh, we already have some uh, questions coming in. So, Philip, there's a question from uh, Mary Thompson, and uh, she is uh, from University of Wisconsin-Madison. The question is, let me just read that out. In the Nebula example, what might happen when insurance companies get involved? So, um, I mean, insurance companies are um, likely to be concerned um, because they may see a potential drop in their revenue. I think their primary interest is going to be the veracity and the truth behind the, the um, uh, assertion that's being made that the data that's individually owned is in fact sufficiently protected so that it is not um, manipulated and or possible to commit fraud around. That would be my guess that their biggest concern is going to be that this could be somehow fraudulently um, attacked and exploited in ways that they as insurers might end up holding the bag for. Um, what we have seen in the last 15 years uh, and in particular in the last 10 or 11, with um, things like the financial uh, coin space and the cryptocurrency space, is that there have been tons of attacks and hacks on various um, things like wallets or third party exchanges. There has never been a successful attack on the chain itself and the data therein. So while there are, are uh, uh, there is a lot of work to be done and I don't want to minimize the areas where there is um, uh, where there are challenges remaining, particularly around things like key management and such. Um, nevertheless, I don't think that the insurance companies are are going to find this to be um, uh, ter terrifically problematic. Uh, it may, you know, their worry is it may diminish their value, just as any time there's an opportunity for the elimination of the middleman. 
the middleman that stands to lose is going to have some concerns about that. Thank you, Philip. Uh, Mary, I hope that answers your question. If you have a follow-up, uh, you can, uh, in fact, yeah, you can, you know, post your follow-up question on, you know, on the chat uh, portion of the question pane. Um, there's another question coming coming in, and this is from uh, Warren Smith. He asks about blockchain. Uh, he's saying blockchain underpins uh, cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, but I would want to know what might be the risks to blockchain when applied to a university with a full-time em employment of about 20 to 30,000 students. So th that's where this notion of um uh, permission versus public becomes really critical. Um, in a permissioned environment, I mean, the whole, let me backtrack. The whole point of a, of a coin in this, uh, in this public um, uh, blockchain environment is in many ways um, twofold. It is to um, be able to obviously exchange something that has got publicly attributed value through a, um, through a market um, with one another in it for the transaction of purchases and goods. But the other thing that it does is provides a, a mechanism, a reward structure to keep participants who otherwise may be um, uh, none, not trustworthy parties from otherwise disrupting or, um, or uh, walking away with access to um, the the, uh, the assets of the of the blockchain, and so the purpose that that behind ETH, um, Ether, and and um, and Bitcoin has two two goals. One is to be able to handle those commercial exchanges, but the other is to provide incentives for the maintenance of the integrity of the system. That's essential when it is public and anybody is allowed to join. In the context of universities, I, d I anticipate that the majority of universities will start with permissioned environments among clusters of institutions for whom trust already exists. Um, that may be a, a regional consortium, that may be a system uh, level consortium, or something of that sort, uh, where there are lots of methods in place um, by which assurance of participation in a, uh, in a f forward and, uh, and ethical uh, legal way already have layers in in there, and therefore that side of it doesn't means that you don't need coins at all for that matter. And you could use coins in that context as a sensor. This is one of an interesting way to think about it. You as the as the um, community that runs the permission network can decide the valuation of the coinage that you may use if you wish to use coins at all. You don't have to. Um, but if you do wish to use coins, you can make them extremely, extremely cheap, 10 to the minus 12th of a cent, for example, um, and use it as a way of sensing the, participate, the, the relative participation of the players in that environment as a way of essentially getting analytics data on who's participating and to what level and where. Um, that could be useful uh, from the purposes of monitoring system use and, and validating that there is um, everybody in the consortium in terms of membership is making equal contributions or et cetera to, to the work involved. Um, so, so you have to be careful. I, I don't think we're going to see most registrars, if you're thinking about credentials, for example, most registrars comfortable with the idea that their uh, registration data is going to be in a public blockchain. That you will know one company that is um, out there doing work in this space, uh, and that company's learning machines, and they have been very careful to make sure that the only thing on the blockchain record is in fact essentially like a notary transaction that a particular event has occurred. That is, I achieved the certificate at the end of this course, and here's the time stamp, and here's the date stamp, and here's the issuing institution. But all of the data, PID data and other data about that issuance still resides in the individual campus. And so the registrar and the campus hasn't offloaded any of that responsibility to the blockchain at all. They're using the blockchain as a, as a third party notary in effect. There is value in doing so, um, but it is not, in my view, the most interesting and useful potential value, value proposition for a blockchain. And so um, 
the other downside is that the process of putting it on the blockchain so that it, they're using the public blockchain in this context for just that notarization, you have the cost of doing so is based on the market price of Bitcoin uh, at the time that the commits are being made. And so there is an expense associated with that, which is to some extent a little bit beyond the control of any of the institutions because it's a market driven expense. Thank you, Philip. Uh, and I hope that answers uh, your question, Warren. Uh, there's another, quite a few questions coming in, uh, Philip, so let me run through. Uh, there's uh, one from Rob Curtin. Rob's from Microsoft. Uh, he's asking, uh, he's saying HE is the middleman for competencies. Why would institutions with brands want blockchain to succeed? And if the brand, uh, branded schools are out, how will this take off? Ah, good question. And so there's two things. One is the institutions are not, I mean, the issuers are still the issuers. There's no, um, nothing that is removing that responsibility, that judgment and that affirmation of achievement from those institutions. So um, in one sense, you could argue that institutions and their brands associated with the issuance of a credential remain intact. The institution is still guaranteeing that the learning that this individual achieved by their participation in the courses for which they were responsible is in fact um, a, uh, truly represented by the certification that has been given. Uh, whether that certification is a certificate, whether that's a BS or BA or, or something other than that, the institution still owns that and that's still tracked. What it does do, and I think the point that you're that you're raising is it has the potential for institutions that are um, not in the league tables, at least in the top 50 institutions in the, in the world or the top 100 institutions in the world to have more of an opportunity to um, demonstrate the achievements that their students uh, have made. And they can do that by not only asserting the issuance of the credential, um, which in one sense as a lower brand institution is still a lower brand issuer um, but they have the opportunity to back that up with further evidence that is in the case of if you think of the issuance as something that involves a data model that's drawn from the open badge initiative version two you have a rubric statement about how the individuals the issuance of that achievement was judged you have a opportunity to say these are the in fact the assessment methods and here is the ontology of these assessment methods that were applied to make that judgment and you even have an array of student work that you digitized work that you can point to and say and here's what the student work was work by which this judgment was based and which justifies the assertions that we're making and my guess is that that could in fact threaten the existing um, credentialed branded institutions so, to some extent, because all of a sudden you're seeing students that are doing things at a mid, what was formerly a mid-tier or lower-tier institution, which for all the world look like they're being appropriately judged, that the student's work is pretty good, and that maybe that institution um, needs to be thought about something somewhat differently. Thank you, Philip. And uh, Rob, I, you know, I hope that answers your question. You can reply to us in the questions. Uh, uh, panel. Uh, there's another one coming in from Steve Lovas, uh, and uh, Rob says thank you, sir. Rob, uh, uh, thank you. Steve uh, from Colorado State University is asking Philip, is there any structure to signal privacy uh, security practices on the back end for off-chain storage, as you've described with learning machines? Um, let me see if I understand the question correctly. Um, so if you're off-chain storage in some, in the traditional sense, so the places that, that um, uh, currently manage their credentials and the like, as they always have, um, have their, uh, have their uh, student information systems and all that behind their, um, you know, could be a Kerberos-based environment, or it could be a, a various other security environments. Um, and they're doing their best to make sure that that data is not compromised in any way. Um, my, my claim and the reason that I presented some of those slides is to say that even the best efforts to do so 
are ultimately doomed to failure at some point. It's not a question of if, it's just a question of when. So um, I suspect that you will start to see that those off-chain backend systems begin to import and, and layer onto them in further, in my view, somewhat futile, but further attempts at uh, ensuring service uh, security, some of the encryption mechanisms that are emerging from the blockchain world. Um, and that you might very well see that as um, a, additional attempts to, uh, to keep those centralized resources more protected than they have been. But I think that, you know, something that I know the libraries learned a long time ago when it came, comes to repositories, um, they have a concept that's referred to as locks. Lots of copies keeps things safe. And the notion is that if you really want to make something really safe, then you distribute copies of it everywhere. And in some sense, that's exactly the underlying principle behind the distributed nature of decentralized uh, repositories and blockchains. Um, you layer onto that the encryption. Now, the, the challenge has been that we have an encrypted at the at the field level, if you will, in, in the blockchain, so that the ability to selectively disclose, disclose particular elements requires still a relatively humongous challenge of managing keys. And when you have something encrypted in this format, you lose a key in your toast. <laughs> there is no way to recover that. There is no backdoor. There's no regeneration process. There's lots of things people have done to try to give you know, multi-key signing so that the data is still accessible by a majority of five other key signers who you trusted and given uh, a, a copy of a key to, um, um, that they all have to be put together in order for the lock to undo, et cetera, et cetera. There's various ways that people have tried to deal with this. But um, ultimately, um, I think that the off-chain storage, the most effective thing is going to be to encrypt it, to have a, a fingerprint essentially to the link to it from the chain, and thereby you preserve both the security of it, but also the fact that's the key evidence uh, uh, or a key attribute of the blockchain that no one manipulated that off-chain stored object uh, during the time it was um, between which the original blockchain-based certification of its existence and its value has been generated and the time that the person looking at, at it now, uh, time t plus n, um, is, is viewing it. Because if, if there is not certainty that that provenance has been maintained and that immutability has been maintained, then, then its value is very, very low. Thank you, Philip. And uh, Stephen, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> okay, I uh, think that is about that. We don't have any more questions to to uh, relay over to you, Philip. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think uh, we can proceed. We have come to the end of today's session. Philip, I would like to thank you for presenting for us here today. Uh, it's been a it's it's been a total honor for us to have you here. I would like to thank uh, about 80 institutions that joined us today. Uh, you know, Campus Consortium has been dedicated to hosting these kind of ed talks to bring contribution to the higher ed community. Our next uh, ed talk will feature Dr. Paul Dussel. He's the Vice President for Student Affairs and Student Success at University of South Florida. Uh, he will share his expertise on predictive analytics uh, in higher education. It is uh, scheduled for August 30th from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. We'll be rolling out the invite shortly. Uh, just before we go, um, I would like to go over my one slide on, on uh, Campus Consortium grants that we are running. Uh, and this one is exclusively, this one is ex exclusively on, uh, on, on today's session. Uh, we are running GDPR uh, assessment uh, grant, and I'll just bring that up on your screen now. So this, we have a technology partner, uh, in, you know, that will send their senior consultant to your institution to do a GDPR assessment. Uh, we we are running a grant that will uh, sponsor or fund about eight thousand dollars of that cost, including travel and uh, you know per diem cost of the gentleman who's going to be on site uh, he will at the end of the day he, he will spend three to four days 
depending on the size of your institution, depending on the uh, audit that you require. Uh, and then, of course, at the end of the, at the, end of, uh, the visit, we'll pr provide a 75-pager report, which should uh, bring uh, you know, that uh, particular assessment uh, to its conclusion. Uh, that's uh, uh, what we are running today. Uh, really quickly, you know, for those who have joined us for the first time, uh, I just want to let everybody know that uh, you know we run these uh, as as a consortium. We are running a lot of initiatives and programs to help higher ed, and one of them has been you know our grant programs. We've already awarded more than 10.1 million since Jan uh, last year in grants, including you know grants such as cloud hosting. Uh, or, you know, single sign-on, identity grant, attendance tracking, and campus portal. Uh, we have a whole bunch of awardees, and uh, you'll be seeing uh, uh, some of that on a social media site from time to time. We want to do well for them. We want to help them uh, in whatever way we can. Moving forward, these grants, what we cover is implementation and licensing. Uh, and uh, of course, the consortium sponsors, you know, 50% to 100% of some of these projects. Uh, uh, what we need in order to give these grants to institutions is just to know that they demonstrate commitment and that they really require the solution on campus. And we're willing to help them out. If you want to apply, you can visit our website at campusconsortium.org or simply submit your grant application at grantapplication at campusconsortium.org. You will receive this deck in the form of the email after the session is, in, is concluded. If you have any questions or you want to connect with Paul, you can simply send us an email at info at campusconsortium.org. Uh, right? Uh, uh, sorry, if you want to connect with uh, Philip, uh, you can simply send us an email at info at campusconsortium.org. Philip, uh, if you're still there, sir, uh, thank you so much uh, for. Uh, for you know this brilliant brilliant presentation we still have some people you know uh, hanging in there if you want to say any last uh, few words before we go um just to thank everyone for for hanging in there for this um and to thank um the my colleagues at Arizona State who have been spending a, a tremendous amount of time and energy to help think through the appropriate applications of um this kind of technology and um and their commitment to um, to their students and to their communities for uh, for making real their uh, their award of being the number one innovation university in the U.S. Uh, by at least one league table measure, and also to uh, let people know that I'd be happy to uh, follow up on comments directly um, uh, either through Campus Consortium or uh, through the emails that I put up earlier. Um, the simplest is probably rhzconsulting.pdl at gmail. So thanks very much, and uh, I'm happy to uh, to take questions uh, offline afterwards. Email them to me or whatever you like. That's noted. Thank you, Philip, and uh, thank you everybody. About 80 institutions have joined us. You know, it's been heck of a heck of a ride today. So th thank you once again, and this is Campus Consortium along with Philip signing off. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.